Welcome back, everyone. We have an exciting episode to get into. Today, we're going to be going through our normal stuff. I'll be doing a story fund update, showing you which companies I sold and bought, the latest portfolio update, and then we have, of course, my comparison against the S&P 500. I'm on a race. I'm on a mission to outperform the S&P 500, and so far, it's been difficult, but I'll show you the progress and how close we are. But that's not the main thing I want to talk about today. The main subject I want to go into is something that I've noticed in the earnings reports of companies for years now, but it's become a growing problem. And that is the problem of shrinkage. Now, shrinkage is a euphemism that companies use to talk about theft. That's really what shrinkage means. So whenever a company says we're seeing shrink or shrinkage in the industry, that means we're seeing criminals come in and steal our stuff. That's literally the, the translation you can do there. So we're seeing growing theft. And this has become such a big problem that companies' earnings reports now, especially these top retailers, are getting devastated by thieves. They're literally stealing the returns away from investors. The latest victim of this is Dick Sporting Goods. Let's go ahead and take a look at how Dick Sporting Goods is doing today. Well, you can see that the stock price over the past five days, it dropped substantially. It's down 25% today because they just came out with their earnings report. In their earnings report, what do you know? Dick's Sporting Goods falls 24% as the retailer slashes outlook over theft concerns. So we have the headline there from CNBC. I think the most devastating part of this entire thing here is the earnings per share versus what the actual estimates were. They reported $2.82 in earnings versus $3.81 expected. They missed earnings by an entire dollar. That is a substantial miss. Now, a lot of people have suggested that there must be other factors. Dix didn't miss by an entire dollar just because of theft. There are, of course, many different factors, but theft is the largest one. These retailers earn thin margins. So when people come in and steal items, that affects the profits disproportionately high. And this is now becoming such a big issue that it's becoming the headline story with all of these companies. Let's go ahead and take a look at CNBC this morning when they're talking about the issue of theft in terms of Macy's and Dick's. Sporting goods, the earnings came in at $2.82 a share. That was nearly a dollar worse than expectations on revenue of $3.22 billion. That was just uh, shy of what the street was looking for. Comp store sales were up by 1.8% during the quarter, but that was worse than the 2.7% the street was expecting. Dix is also lowering its earnings guidance for the full year. And if you read through this release, I was trying to figure out what happened, why they missed by so much when revenue was not off by all that much. Lauren Hobart is the president and CEO. She says while they were able to post another double digit EBT margin, their second quarter profitability was short of expectations, due in large part because of the impact of elevated inventory shrink, an increasingly serious issue impacting many retailers. That's a huge number, though. The street obviously wants to hear more information about it. That stock down by 19% this a little morning suspect, on this. suspect, isn't it? I mean... Uh, yeah, to say that we're going to miss, we missed by a dollar, and it was be largely because of shrinkage. And by the way, this, this commentary is above even the headline that they put in for any of the numbers on this. Um, shrinkage, clearly a huge problem for a lot of retailers. It's something every single one of them has mentioned and talked about how the shrinkage is getting greater. Um, but this is a situation where they haven't mentioned shrinkage at Dick's in 20 years. Got to be mature. Got to be mature. We should be, I think we should start calling it stealing. So we, I mean, it's just stupid. To yeah, we have Dick's mentioning shrinkage in their earnings report. Okay. He's right, though. We have Joe Kernan here, and he makes a good point. We should really call this theft. That is what it is. It's the appropriate label for it. As ugly as it sounds, these items are not becoming lost. They're not growing legs and walking out of stores themselves. They're being stolen by criminals. Now, what they mention here in the actual earnings report is true. We have the earnings report pulled up here. This was posted just an hour ago from Dick Sporting Goods, and they have the most important things that they put at the very top. That's what the company wants you to know. That's really what they're trying to highlight. It's like the above fold material. So we have the highlights here and they, they give some basic forecasts, double digit growth. They try to highlight some of the positives, but then right here we have the quote from the chief executive officer, the CEO of the company, right here in the top portion of the earnings report. 
We are pleased with our strong sales performance for the second quarter, led by robust transaction growth and continued market share gains. Sounds positive so far. Within the quarter, sales accelerated significantly in July, and we remain confident in delivering positive comp sales for 2023, while we posted another double-digit EBT margin. Our Q2 profitability was short our expectations in large part due to the impact of elevated inventory shrink, an increasingly serious issue impacting many retailers. Despite moderating our 2023 earnings per share outlook, the enthusiasm we have for our businesses and confidence in long-term growth opportunities, so on and so forth. They say it's good, good future. The CEO is going out of their way to say that this is really impacting our businesses. This is no longer just a little line item somewhere buried in this earnings report. It's at the very top of it. And again, this is something that I've noticed for a while. I read these earnings reports from these companies. I look at their call transcripts. And when I'm doing analysis on companies like Costco, I'm constantly comparing it with other retailers. Now, a couple examples we can just look at here. A few earnings reports from these companies over the past couple of quarters. We have here Macy's Q1 report. So they recently just reported Q2. And like Dick Sporting Goods, they're selling off big time. And part of it because of growing theft. In their last earnings report call, they said, quote, Our annual gross margin rate outlook includes an estimate for increased shrink which we call shortage relative to our initial expectations. They're forecasting increased theft over time. We have Ulta Beauty. This is their Q1 earnings call transcript. Now, similar to what other retailers have shared, we continue to see pressure from inventory shrink this quarter, and we have updated our full year guidance to reflect the persistence of this trend. Ulta says, now similar to what other retailers have shared, we continue to see pressure from inventory shrink this quarter, and we have updated our full year guidance to reflect the persistence of this trend. Ulta is another company that has underperformed this year. If you look at the stock chart, it's gone down while the market has gone up. And what do you know? They're lowering their guidance, lowering guidance specifically because of theft. And this isn't just your, again, this is not just random people sneaking an item into a bag. A lot of this is far more aggressive and organized crime. They say while shrink is a result of various factors, theft, specifically organized retail crime, is an increasingly concerning challenge, especially as we see a rise in violence and aggression during these incidents. The employees here, of course, don't wanna work in any type of environment that has violence or aggression. So in most cases, they're told to not interfere if people are stealing, making it easier to steal items. So you have Ulta Beauties getting robbed left and right by criminals. Our first priority is the safety and well-being of our associates and our guests. We are committed to ensuring a safe working environment and investing in fixtures, training, support structures, and increased staffing and security to aggressively address these concerning trends. So they have to make investments, more expenses to combat the theft. Not only do they lose a number of items, which lowers their margins, but they also have to invest more, which also lowers their margins. And you can see why the actual guidance is going down on these companies. We have Target, for example. This is from their latest earnings call. This is Q2 of this year. In addition to these more recent challenges, our team continues to face an unacceptable amount of retail theft and organized retail crime. As you'll hear in more detail from Michael, shrink, again, theft, in the second quarter remained consistent with our expectations, well above sustainable levels. And unfortunately, safety incidents associated with what are moving in the wrong direction. So again, in targets, they're not only concerned about just theft, that they're concerned about safety in general. If somebody's walking out with a cart full of stuff and someone tries to stop them, then you don't just have theft, you have an altercation with a criminal, a crime in action. And people do dumb things while committing crimes. That's why there's oftentimes people getting hurt when that wasn't even the intention of the crime. They just wanted to steal something, but it ends up with someone being shot or someone being really hurt. During the first five months of this year, our stores saw a 120% increase in theft incidents involving violence or threats of violence. As a result, we're continuing to work tirelessly with the retail industry groups and community partners to find solutions to promote safety for our store teams and our guests. They saw 120% increase in theft and violent crimes. 120%, so it's over doubled in a single year. That's a substantial problem. Not only that, but they also estimate that there's $1.3 billion of earnings lost to theft in Target alone this year. Meaning that if these criminals weren't robbing targets and aggressively violently threatening them, 
that you could have $1.3 billion dividend out to the investors. That is substantial for a size of a company like Target. That is a substantial dividend or buyback program they could be doing. So thieves, again, are stealing from the investors. They're stealing from the community members. They're stealing from the employees. It hurts everyone else. We have Walmart. Walmart last quarter said shrink has increased a bit this year. It increased last year. It's uneven across the country. It's not in every market. Some markets are higher than others. Walmarts are every part of the country. So they're looking at certain areas where markets are horrible for theft and some areas where they're not facing any theft. This has become such a big problem for Walmart that there's places where they've operated at a loss for a number of years trying to address the problem. And Walmart has finally thrown in the towel. In March of this year, we learned that Walmart closed two stores in Portland, the last two stores they had there, because of, what do you know, theft. The company said it was shuttering those stores for financial reasons, as Walmart CEO announced record-breaking retail theft nationwide has been impacting the company's bottom line. There's too much theft in Portland. Too many stores getting robbed. Walmart can't even operate there. This is crazy. This is almost embarrassing. What's going on here? I know we have some viewers from Portland. What is happening here where companies, great U.S. companies, can't even function. They can't even operate business because they're getting robbed day in and day out. Next up, we have Dollar General, which I'll remind you, Dollar General is an excellent company. It's had a 20% CAGR for a long period of time, but recently it's struggling. This year it's down big. It's down 35%, down 25% just from the last earnings report. So Dollar General is massively underperforming the rest of the market. And we have one of the factors they're citing with their underwhelming performance this year. One is shrink, and it's going to be the most difficult comparison on a year-over-year -year basis. Out of all the factors that Dollar General is looking at hurting their company, right now, the worst comparative factor is year-over-year -year theft. Now, they didn't give the exact numbers like Target did, where it increased 120%, but do you think criminals are only targeting Target, and then they're leaving out Dollar General? Is there much more security in Dollar General than there is in Target? I don't think so. I have to imagine it's pretty similar. And I have to imagine part of this underwhelming stock performance is a result of criminals stealing the merchandise there. Now, there is one company that stands out where they don't have much of an issue with shrink. That is Costco. And I've pointed this out many times in the past if you've been following along. This is from Costco. They say, by the way, one of the questions that we've gotten a couple of times as of late because of some of the companies out there reported much higher shrink, our shrink is intact. We haven't seen any major changes in shrink. Now, Costco has a lot of defenses against theft. They have a lot of employees in every single warehouse. They have one entrance, one exit. It is a membership-based warehouse. The items are bulkier, and they check the receipts at the exit. So it's just a little bit more obstacles. And although there is theft at Costco, people still go in and steal things, especially smaller items, smaller electronics. You'll see that Costco's have been putting... More, more guards around electronics and that type of thing. Also, people still close because it's easier to sneak that by. But overall, Costco can control their theft far better than other retailers. They do not have a problem with organized crime retail anywhere to the extent these other companies have. Now, of course, we can't forget about Home Depot, another company that's facing increased theft from their locations. They said in their last earnings report, in the second quarter, our gross margin was 33%, a decrease of eight basis points from the second quarter last year, primarily driven by pressure from shrink. Primarily, the biggest factor in this company earning less in margins this year over last year is theft. So what we see here is that thieves don't discriminate. They're willing to steal from a Lowe's or a Home Depot. They're willing to steal from Walmart or Target. They will steal from Dollar General. They'll steal anywhere they can, any state that they can. Anywhere that they can get away with it, thieves will steal. Now, we can see that this is a problem across the entire industry, and it's an accelerated problem, meaning it's going up at an accelerated pace. This isn't a slight increase. This is going up 120% year over year. Target cited the actual number. Dick's Sporting Goods is down 25% this year because of it. We have Dollar General down 35% this year, largely because of theft. But there's one company one that likely is experiencing theft in a way that no other company is right now. And that is one that sells very expensive collector shoes. We have Nike. There is this write-up from the Wall Street Journal, an in-depth research on the extravagant measures that thieves are going to to steal high-priced Nike items. 
So let's go ahead and just take a look at some of the examples they cite here. I went ahead and highlighted some of the things that I think are the most striking about this story. First of all, when you think about theft in retail, what comes to mind, especially if you're not a thief. So I'm not a thief, but when I think about theft from retail, I initially just thought, well, this is probably people that they go into the store and we've seen some videos, right? The footage of it where people go into stores and they just stuff their pockets and run out or they fill up a cart and they run out and hope that the cops don't catch them. In some cases, they'll run into an Apple store and they'll try to steal all the devices, even though they're not going to be able to activate them. So it's it's pointless, but they'll try anyways. They'll do whatever they can to get items from the store. That's not what's happening here with Nike. With Nike, the illustration that this story paints is that this problem with theft is much more organized and much bigger than originally thought. The supply chain is under attack right now. The entire supply chain. In February, Nike offered to pay for off-duty and more on-duty police officers to address safety and theft concerns at a Northeast Portland, Oregon store. So we're at the point now where the local governments in Portland and across the US aren't doing enough to stop thieves. So companies are having to subsidize government expenses by paying for police. We're having to pay for police. Can you imagine this? If you're a store operator, you open up a restaurant and you have to start funding the police and fire department. This is city responsibilities, but companies are having to pay for this now, which of course is going to hurt their earnings. They say which has been closed since last year. The Portland's mayor office said the proposal wasn't feasible given staff limitations. Now we have a real problem here when we have stores closing in major cities because they cannot operate and they're having to subsidize the expense of basic city functions like police and fire. That should not be the case. We should have the cities themselves and the taxpayer dollars that go to these, they should be funding this. But not only that, what's described here is not your petty theft going into a retail outlet and sneaking out with something while the cashier isn't looking. That's not what's happening here. Listen to this description. Organized retail crime groups carry out carefully planned operations. They learn about store layouts. They create lists of valuable inventory at each location. When it comes to cargo, the groups hire spotters trained to analyze the contents of shipping containers based on the information in the bill of lading. Retail and logistics companies employees sometimes collude with the criminal groups, according to the National Retail Federation. This sounds like something out of an episode of Narcos. They have, they, they have lists of valuable items in each container. They're paying off employees of the logistics companies, colluding with them. This is a serious issue. These organized crimes are growing. And then we have warehouse thefts. A tip led Los Angeles police in June to warehouse containing millions of dollars worth of stolen merchandise. Several containers of merchandise were taken to the warehouse after making it through the port of Los Angeles. The products were about to be shipped to different locations, but multiple containers were stolen before they could be moved to their final destination. We also have heists in storage yards. About $800,000 worth of Nike sneakers and other products were stolen last September from a secured container drop yard in Memphis, Tennessee, where the company has had its biggest distribution centers. Two people were arrested days later on suspicion of possessing Nike merchandise that was stolen from some of the trailers, according to police experts. The investigation is continuing. So we have theft from the shipping containers, from the warehouses, from the storage yards, and of course from the actual retail outlets themselves. Stealing from stores. Nike's Los Angeles store had reported about $750,000 worth of losses in merchandise thefts over one year. So just to clarify, this isn't all of the stores in California or all of the stores even in Los Angeles. This is just one store that they lost $750,000 due to theft. And they say that this comes primarily from a single crime ring that's responsible for the huge majority of it. In June, they arrested two people that they think was affiliated with the crime ring. Now, Nike, wouldn't you know, is having a terrible stock performance this year, down 15% year to date. Now, you can attribute this to a lot of different reasons, and maybe there are some valid reasons. Maybe the stock was just very overpriced entering the year. Maybe they were facing sales challenges and tough comps anyway. But we know for sure that one of the factors here, a big factor, is the massive amount of theft. Organized retail crime, petty theft, people walking out with items from their store. That is directly hurting this company's stock price. And that's the point that I think is missed here. We try to look at the victims of theft, but the victims are basically everyone but the thief. There's three primary victims with every theft that happens in retail. The first one is the shareholder. 
As a shareholder, you literally own the company. You are part owner of Nike if you have shares in this company. You have equity and ownership rights over the company. If you owned more and more of it, you would literally control the company. As the owner, you're entitled to the profits of the company. If thieves come in and steal your items, they are stealing from you. If you own shares of Nike or Walmart or Target or Dollar General and they're losing money because of theft, they are stealing out of your pockets. But the owners aren't the only victims here. They're not the only ones being stolen from. We also have the employees of the store. Employees are trying to make ends meet. They're trying to work at these retail outlets to make some money, but they have to deal with thieves. They can't really interact with the thieves because if they do, if they have any type of altercation, it can turn violent. So they, they have to let it go and face this in a different way. And if they do have any interactions, it can be very scary. Thieves make for a very unwelcome environment to work in. And on top of that, if the stores end up closing, like many of them are starting to do now, with Walmarts pulling out of Portland, all of the people working at that Walmart lost their job. Now they have to find something else. The employees are victims of this too. Then we also have the customer. The cost of this to the customer is in various ways. These companies have to raise prices because they need to invest so much in security. So it hurts the company's profitability. The company has to pass part of that off to the customer. And then on top of that, if these stores end up closing, which they eventually will, if they lose money long enough, that comes at the cost of the customer. If Walmarts eventually have to close their doors in certain cities because of sustained levels of theft and violent crime, then customers can no longer enjoy shopping at Walmart. Now you might scoff and say that we're better off without Walmart or, you know, I don't like shopping at Walmart. The reason that people shop at Walmart is because it's the lowest price. The type of customers that shop at Walmart are typically lower income. So that lower income customer is now losing access to the best value prices, meaning that their standard of living just got worse. So the theft going on right now does impact everyone from the communities in general, to the customers, to the employees, to the shareholder. Now looking at this as a shareholder, I have to ask myself, how can I protect myself from these organized retail crimes, from having my profits stolen from me? I don't wanna have these very sad moments where my stocks drop 30%, because of thieves. So what you'll see in my portfolios is I've limited the amount of exposure I have to retail. In the story fund, I've actually made a couple trades here. I've concentrated my portfolio more into S&P Global. So I've sold out of some smaller positions and really just concentrated into companies that I don't believe are facing these problems. These companies typically have better means to deal with theft than other ones. Then we have my other portfolio, the passive income account. In this portfolio, I don't have many retailers. I really only have one, and that one is Costco. When I read Costco's report, for whatever reason, they haven't been dealing with this to the same extent as other retailers. They've just been holding up better combating theft. Now we do have an earnings report coming up with Costco. My guess would be that theft is increasing at Costco as well. It's gonna be somewhat increasing, but lesser than the rest of the industry. So while I believe Costco faces this challenge as well, I think they have a lot better tools to deal with it. So I'm holding on to Costco, but I'm very nervous about other retailers. If the trends keep continuing, I think that this level of theft is going to crush many retailers. They cannot sustain profits and operate this way. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next subject here, which is a portfolio update with the story fund. This is my secondary portfolio and I'm not actively adding to this one. So I have limited capital here, just what I've already invested and I'm trying to grow it. But it's been very tough to grow over the past two years with a largely tech portfolio. Now, you know me. I'm in love with big tech, and I make no apologies for that. A lot of people say it's lazy, it's easy, you could just buy the QQQ. That's true, but I don't think the QQQ goes far enough. It overweights big tech a little bit, but you also throw in companies that I think the valuation is very questionable with Nvidia and Tesla. So I'm creating my own little mini version of an ETF that has weightings that I like with companies that I like even more. So we have big tech, we have Amazon, we have Google, which I love right now. We have Microsoft and we have Apple. I think all of these have incredibly wide moats. And still to this day, you might think that they've performed well. I think they're gonna perform better. I really think these companies have incredibly good core businesses. But we have other companies in my portfolio that were far smaller holdings and a little bit less predictable. And I've been growing an emphasis on having predictable companies. So I have made a few trades here with my smaller positions. Let's go ahead and go through them here. I sold off Adobe, Salesforce, and Pool Corp. 
Now, all of these companies were sold at a gain. So whether they were basically flat or at a slight gain, they were all sold at a position of strength. I wasn't selling out of these companies out of weakness or I, I was scared about their future. I sold Adobe at a decent gain. Salesforce had recovered. I was flat on that company. All three of these companies I think are fantastic. I think they have bright futures. Pool Corp is highly diversified and I think it's gonna continue to do well. Even with the cool down and building new pools, this company stayed really flat. It's performed really well. We have Salesforce. Salesforce is still a powerful company. It's like mini Microsoft. I think the company's great, but I struggle with some things with Salesforce. Namely, their enormous amount of stock-based compensation. It's literally half of their cash flows. And the way that they do their earnings, they report that as part of their earnings, making them look like the valuation's much lower than it actually is. Then we have Adobe, which I actually do like Adobe. I think this one's gonna have a very positive outcome over time. But right now the valuation is a bit stretched, especially compared to what I'm buying. Then we look at the other company that I sold out of, which is Crocs. This company is at such a low valuation. Insiders are buying it. I think it's a really good brand along with Hey Dude. I really do like Crocs. And obviously I've made significant gains in this company, $700 in it with just a tiny position. So I like Crocs, but ultimately, what I thought about Crocs is that it's simply a little too unpredictable. Under Armour was once a high-end brand. It was considered the brand to go to, and then Under Armour fell off, and so did the returns of the stock. You can do the same thing with many other clothing brands throughout history or brand-named items like footwear. It's just an unpredictable industry. So as much as I liked Crocs, I could never put an enormous amount of capital into this company because of the lack of predictability. So what I've done largely is I've moved out of the companies that I think are slightly less predictable or have slightly weaker fundamentals, and then I bought a company that I'm already incredibly bullish on, which is S&P Global. And I think this company should be looked at just like Google, just like Microsoft, and just like Apple. It's a tech company. It's a data company. It's an AI company. They're leveraging all the latest technology. It's highly scalable. It's incredibly efficient. It has great operating leverage. It's just all around, I think, a beast of a company. And so when I look at this, I feel far more confident with the long-term predictability than I do any of the companies that I sold. So that's the portfolio as of now. Highly concentrated into big tech names as well as oversized in Netflix and S&P Global and way overweight into Amazon. And this strategy has been working. Let's go ahead and take a look at my portfolio against the S&P 500. My portfolio is in blue, the S&P 500 is in red. And this is as if I deposited the same amount of money into both portfolios at the same time. So the returns here are perfectly illustrative of the alternate reality had I put this money in the S&P 500. Now, when I do this, I look at it and this is where I got in trouble. I made a lot of buys during this time that I think were less predictable buys. I bought companies that I was basically hoping for a turnaround, companies like Alibaba. I followed Charlie Munger into that one. That one was a big loss. That's why I lost so much money here, as well as we had trouble with Netflix. Netflix sold off. We had Amazon selling off. Now, the good move I did here was I kept to the companies that I thought would recover, mostly Amazon and Netflix. I bought more Netflix at the low. I bought more Amazon around $80 to $90 a share. Those share purchases at lows made it so that my returns when they recovered were dramatically better than the S&P 500. So early 2023, you can see my portfolio racing up and closing in this gap. During this time period right here, my portfolio was over 20% below the S&P 500. Currently, it's 10%. So the gap has been halved over the past year. And we're still closing the gap over time every single month. And what I plan on doing with this portfolio is holding tight to highly predictable companies that I believe will have substantial free cash flow growth over the next five years. And if they predictably grow their free cash flow better than the S&P 500, I believe we'll have better results. So I believe over the next two years, we can close the gap and surpass the S&P 500. So that's the plan with the story fund. I'll continue to track it transparently and we'll see together how this thing turns out. But that's all for this episode. Make sure that you're subscribed with the bell icon because we have some really fun episodes coming up. A few tear ranking videos that I think you're going to love. But that's all for now. I'll see you in the next one.